Thank you all for joining our evening Bible study. Uh, today's topic is obstacles in faith. Uh, we know that uh, Christian life is by faith. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the Apostle Paul, while quoting an Old Testament verse, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, he writes, The righteous shall live by faith. And we are righteous because we are made righteous by the blood of Christ. So, by his blood, he has made us righteous, and the righteousness is in Christ. And subsequently, after receiving this gift of righteousness, we are called to live for him, and we live by faith. And this obedience also comes from faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 5 says, Obedience comes from faith. Now, as we respond to God's gifts, gift of faith, by the way, faith is a gift of God, and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 is written. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. And we all have a measure of faith which God has given us. That's mentioned in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 3. So we can't take credit for our faith. We receive faith from the Lord as he gives us faith in various ways. Very, there are very avenues of faith. We ask for faith, prayer of faith, he gives us faith. The disciples asked him for increase of faith in Luke 17, 5. Then as we hear the word of God, faith increases. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. As you put the word of God to practice, we face difficulties. The difficulties refine our faith. Difficulties, trials, refine our faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7. Also, as they have fellowship with each other, we encourage each other in the faith. That's why Romans, uh, the Romans, Paul wrote, Romans chapter 1, 11 and 12, I long to see you and impart you some special gift to make you strong. That you and I will be mutually refreshed by each other's faith. Also, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we have the gift of faith, a surge of faith. Over and above our measure of faith. According to need, and we cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ to anoint us with the Holy Spirit. He will pour the Holy Spirit upon us, He baptizes us, and we have the gift of faith, which is found in Romans chapter 12, sorry, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 9. Now, while we grow in faith, the evil one will not stop trying to steal the faith God has given us. And he creates circumstances around us to try to pull us back. He will put obstacles in our faith. And today we're going to look at different kinds of obstacles that come in the way of our faith, not only growing, also being preserved. We look to the Lord and depend upon him. Yes, we grow in faith. But sometimes we tend to look away from God. One of the opposites of faith is sight. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We live by faith, not by sight. When you look at the things around us, circumstances, people, we tend to forget what God spoke to us and our faith is called to be on the Lord, meaning His word. We put our faith in Him and listen to what He has to say. And as we look at the things of this world, we have fixed our eyes upon the things of this world and not the eyes on the Lord, then our faith gets affected. So sight comes in the way of faith. And the evil one will try to make us focus on things around us. Look at things around us rather than look to the Lord for growth in the Lord. So sight is the opposite of faith. We should not be carried away by circumstances. I think last week I spoke on this aspect of not being problem conscious, not being devil conscious, not being people conscious, but being God conscious. Not even being self-conscious, only God conscious. As long as we look to him, our faith will increase and we will not let anything come in the way of our faith growing. So first obstacle is sight, sight. We can't close our eyes to what's happening around us. But we trust in the Lord's word to sustain our faith. In the Old Testament, we read how the Lord told the Israelites, 
you're going to give them a land, uh, a promised land, a land of milk and honey, and rescue them from Egypt. Deliver them from Egypt, take them land of milk and honey, and settle them there, promised land. And Moses told them, the miracles and the wonders, God brought them out of Egypt. And while they were in the wilderness, they grumbled. They grumbled about the uh, fish they had in Egypt, onions, garlic, leeks, melons, and the miserable food in the wilderness. They're complaining. And then combine the word of God by faith. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, the writer writes, We also had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was no value to them because those who heard it didn't combine it with faith. We have the gospel preached to us just as they did. Gospel means good news. Today, I have the good news of salvation from sin to the kingdom of God. They had the good news of salvation from Egypt and being settled in the land of Canaan, a land of milk and honey. But everyone didn't combine that message by faith. So along the way, they grumbled and God did amazing things. In spite of the grumbling, he blessed them. There's a point of time in the book of Numbers, if you read, Numbers 13 chapter, verse 1. The Lord told Moses to send some people to the land of Canaan, the promised land, to spy out the land, to check out the land. One from every tribe of Israel. Twelve tribes, except the tribe of Levi. Instead of Levi, Ephraim, Manasseh, sons of Joseph, Bessan, representative. Twelve people went, spies, to spy out the land. And they were in this promised land uh, for 40 days. Now the Lord told uh, Moses, send these spies, ten people into the land, to check out the land. The land I am giving to the Israelites. I am giving to the Israelites. The Lord told them, I'm going to give you this land. Before they enter, before the spies went. God already told them, I'm giving you the land. And these people went, all of them, including Joshua and Caleb. They saw the land. There were the Anakites there, the descendants of Nephilim. Nephilim were giants, very tall people. And the spies come back after 40 days saying, land is... Uh, uh, the, the, the land is very nice in terms of the fruit. They brought a cluster of grapes, big ones, pomegranates, figs, they brought back. But they said, oh, those people there, they are very strong, very strong. And we can't take their land. Out of 12 people, 10 of them said, they can't take their land. Only Joshua and Caleb says, God is with us. We'll go and take the land. God already told them, I'm giving you the land. But they came back Doubting, but God spoke. They said, no, 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 we can't go. Has God brought us from Egypt all the way to die here? Look at those people there. They're tall people, Anakites. You know what they say? If you look at 13th chapter of uh, Numbers, both 32 and 33, read about how they said they were very tall people, very big people, giant-sized people, and we were like grasshoppers to ourselves and to them. We looked like grasshoppers in our own eyes and the eyes of those people. So where were the eyes fixed? Upon their size. We are very small. To ourselves, we are like grasshoppers. To them, we are grasshoppers. They are very big. What about God speaking to them? They looked at the sight. They looked at things, uh, looked at the enemy or rather the people they are going to displace and they looked at themselves. In their eyes, they were grasshoppers. In the eyes of the Anakas, they were grasshoppers. So we can't go. We can't take the land. But God, I'm giving you the land. Typical example of being carried away by circumstances and looking at yourself with your own perspective and looking at yourself from other people's perspective. For Anakas, they were grasshoppers. For themselves, they were grasshoppers. But those people were giants. Very tall people. How can we go and take the land? They forgot the Lord who brought them out of Egypt with miracles, signs, and wonders. How often we get carried away by what we see and affects faith in what God has spoken to us. He said very clearly, go and spy out the land. I'm giving you the land. The Israelites. Who is saying? God is saying. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And therefore, they were there for 40 days. They came back. And because of their disobedience, 
A lot of them, they have wandered in the desert for 40 years. Why were they for 40 years in, in, uh, before they entered the land of Canaan? The distance is not so much. It, it, normal, normal course will take 10 days. 10 days from, uh, from Goshen, from where they were, uh, to the border of River Jordan. But it took 40 years. One year for every day they were spying out the land and came and said, oh, we cannot. That's why they spent 40 years in, in the wilderness. Because they disobeyed, or rather they didn't believe what God spoke and looked at the circumstances, looked at themselves with, the God, with their own perspective, took them with the, their own perspective, forgot to look at God, what God had said. And that's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness. So often we find that sight comes in the way of our faith. As compared to Abraham. Look at Abraham. He was about 100 years old and God told him he's going to have a son. And Romans chapter 4, verse 18 onwards, it says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. So being father of many nations. I've been said of him, so shall the offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact his body was as good as dead. And Sarah's womb also was as good as dead. But he did not waver through unbelief and gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded, God had, uh, had power to do what he had promised. If we looked at circumstances only and forgot about what God had said, he would have given up. Against all hope based on circumstances. In hope in God, he believed. And so big father many nations. So we're supposed to be like that. We are his offspring today. You and me are Abraham's seed. We are supposed to be like that. Against all hope based on circumstances, in hope in God we believe, and through faith and patience we inherit the promise of God. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, through faith and patience we inherit the promise of God. Praise God for his amazing grace. And therefore let's be like Abraham. You're supposed to be like him. So shall our offspring be. Where's offspring? Because if you look at Galatians 3.16, it says, Galatians 3.16, the promise is spoken to Abraham and to seed. Crypto don't say, and to seeds, meaning many people. But unto his seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Verse 29, Galatians 3.29. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. And as according to the promise. So we should be like Abraham. Don't be like the ten spies. Whereas as compared to the ten spies, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they were a different kind. They are a different spirit. And they said, no, we'll go. Our God will give us the land. They believe what God said. Or twelve people and two uh, uh, believe. That's why they could enter the land of Ken. None of them others entered. They all who disobeyed and trusted in God did not enter. They died in the desert. Only Joshua and Caleb crossed the river Jordan. Not even Moses, for different reasons, God said, you want to cross over. So don't go by sight. Go by faith. Opposite of faith is sight. Against all hope based on circumstances, in hope in the Lord what he has spoken, we believe. And God will honor our belief. Isaiah 28, 16. No one who trusts in him will be put to shame. No one who trusts in him will be put to shame. The second obstacle in our faith, in our walk with God, is the fact that we have fears. We get scared. Being scared of circumstances, which also is a result of sight, fear and faith don't go together. Fear and faith don't go together. A very typical story in the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, Chapter 14, verse 25 to 31. Very familiar story. Where the disciples are on the boat. The fourth watch of the night, the Lord is walking on the water. Previous evening, he had spoken there. They all heard him. They went away. He stayed back. The fourth watch of the night, between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. is the fourth watch. They are going in the boat, and the Lord is walking on the water. Imagine, dark, it is 3, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., very dark, they see somebody walking on the water, something very unusual, never seen before. They thought it's a ghost. They got scared. It's a ghost, they thought. And the Lord tells them, 
take courage, it's only I. Here these people are on the boat, all these stalwarts of faith, disciples of Christ, and the Lord is walking on the water, and look at him, it must be a ghost. The Lord must have known that. He says, take courage, it's only I. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. If it is you, he heard him, he heard the voice. What did the Lord say? It's only I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. They're scared. Think it's a ghost. I don't know why they should be scared of ghosts. They are believers in Christ. And they have victory over demonic spirits. Here, they look at early morning, 3 a.m., 6 a.m., a figure walking on the water, unusual sight. And then they get scared. And the Lord said, it's, a, it's I. Take courage. I. And then Peter says, if it is you, you would recognize the voice, no? Jesus' voice, you would recognize. If it is you, why if? It is, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. So Peter heard Jesus, saw Jesus, and got confirmation this is Jesus. So what does he do? Gets out of the boat and walks on the water. As he walks on the water, suddenly he looks at the fact he's walking in the water, something unusual. It's not done. And he looks at the water and then he be begins to sing, he cries out. Cries out to Jesus and the Lord saves him. He saw Jesus, he heard Jesus, he walked on the water. Then what happened? Looks at the water and then forget about what Jesus said. He went, went off his mind and he thought, it's not happening. I'm walking in the water, should not be happening. It should not be happening. And being, beginning to sing, he cried out, Jesus to save him. And by the way, he was a fisherman. All fishermen know swimming. So why should he think he's going to drown? The Lord picked him up. And he said, why did you doubt? Why were you afraid? Why did you doubt? So when you already walking on the water by faith, then looks at the circumstances and develops fear. When you're scared of such circumstances, care of what was happening around you, our faith is affected. He had faith in God, Lord's word. Come, come. If it's you, if it's you tell me to come to you. And Lord said, come. Only Peter only said, no, if it's you tell me to come to you. And Lord says, come. Both an agreement. And he walks in water by faith. And then he looks at the unusual event happening. He begins to doubt and again he gets scared. How often when we get scared, we shouldn't get scared actually, because he delivers from all fears. As just now, uh, Sister Grace uh, read that passage from uh, Psalm 34 in verse 8. David says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Every unhealthy fear, Lord, already delivered us. So no question of fear. When you have fear, we forget what the Lord has said. That's what Peter forgot. Let me, uh, the Lord says, come. He walked on the water. But then looked at what he's doing, got scared, lost courage, and began to sink. He must have forgotten also that he's a fisherman and he could swim. But then Lord picked him up. Now how comes how often when we get scared, we have fear, we forget the promises of God. Instead of getting look at circumstances, look to the Holy Spirit. And he's not a spirit of timidity or fear. In Romans 8.15 is written, For God did not give a spirit that makes a slave again to fear, but is a spirit of sonship. For him we cry, Abba, Father. So unhealthy fears take away our faith. We all know this verse in the Bible, the promise of God, Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, But I know, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. We know that verse. Very, very popular verse it is. For every one of us it is. Every good promise is for every one of us. Yet when it comes to the future, how often we worry about the future. December 31st, most churches, they have a Thanksgiving service. The event goes and thanks God for the previous year's events and for sustaining us through all these years and especially COVID. Went through COVID, we sustained, praise God, thank God, how faithful he is, all that we say. 31st December. 1st January, how will this year be? 
what will happen this year. And we begin to worry. We look at the future, begin to worry. Whereas the Lord has said, I have the best plans for you. So anxiety and fear will not, not only make us forget the word of God, even remember the word of God, we may not believe it's for us. Yeah, God is faithful to his word, but for me, I'm not sure it will happen to me or not. So remove every fear. Unhealthy fears are not from God. Only a reverent fear of God we should be having. So when you allow these fears to occupy your mind and the heart, our faith gets affected. By faith, Peter walked in the water. By lack of faith, because of fear, he began to sink. So, don't any unhealthy fear occupy your mind. Third hindrance, or obstacle in faith, is doubt. Doubt. Doubting. And I told you how the evil one wants to try to destroy our faith. He can't destroy our faith, but he will try to reduce our faith by showing circumstance. Look at the circumstances. We're trying to instill fear. He'll try to instill fear in us. That's his job. Also, try to put doubt in our minds about things of God. He even tried that with Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. If you are the Son of God, tell the stones to become bread. And the Lord quoted the Bible to the evil one as an example for us. It's written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. We live by the word, not just by food. Food is important, not just by uh, bread. Or every word that proceeds. He tried to put a doubt in the mind of Jesus that he was the son of God. Prove. Because till that point of time, God had not done any miracle. He had not done any miracle. Just got baptized, taken the, uh, led by the Spirit to the Jordan, the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. Not yet any miracle. He was hungry. He could have made the uh, stone into bread. And Peter, uh, the devil is tempting him. If you are the son of God, tell the stones to become bread. If, if means creates doubt. Lord didn't fall for that. He, from the word he clarified. Now, take an example of the person who is considered to be great in the sight of God. A great man of God. The only one described in the Bible as a great man of God. That is John the Baptist. Of course, Christ is different. He's God become man. Among those born women, no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said, testified about that. Matthew 11, 11. Great in the sight of God. Prophecy about him before he's born. Luke 1, 15. He's the great in the sight of God. This great man of God had prophesied in John 1, 29 about Jesus. Look the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of this world. Look at the Lamb of God. He's pointing Jesus, people to Jesus and he's the Lamb of God. That, then after that, some of his own disciples left him and followed Jesus. That was John the Baptist's ministry. Not to attack people to himself, but to point people to Jesus. That's what he did. A voice in the wilderness to make way the ways of the Lord, make straight the ways of the Lord. Point to Jesus and said, look, Lamb of God. They're all waiting for the Lamb of God to come. The Passover Lamb, Old Testament Passover Lamb is symbolic of the Messiah. He is the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. What the sacrifice was symbolic of the Messiah. Firstborn male without defect was chosen as a Passover lamb. Male, firstborn without defect. Meaning no injuries, no blemishes in the body. Symbolic of the sinless son of God. They knew about the lamb of God. And John the said, this is the lamb of God. Look, lamb of God. Takes the sins of the whole world. But later on, when this great man of God was in prison and awaiting sentence, because of circumstances, he had doubts about who, this, who Jesus is. He doubted his own prophecy. His own prophecy came from his mouth. He doubted. And he's telling his, his, his uh, disciples, his, send them to Jesus, go and find out, is he the one? Or you look for someone else. 11 chapter of Matthew, the first few verses. From prison, John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus. Go and find out, is he the one? 
or may look for someone else. He forgot his own prophecy. Look, the Lamb of God. Now what's happening? He's doubting his own prophecy. But look at the way the Lord clarifies the doubt. He sends messengers back to John the Baptist. Go and tell him, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, leprosy is healed, goodness is preached. The signs that accompany the Messiah's ministry. They had a tradition that they believed that if the Messiah comes, he will do all these things. Heal the sick, raise the dead, heal the blind, heal the deaf, preach good news. Go and tell him. And they go back. After they go back, look at the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not uh, trying to criticize John the Baptist for doubting. John the Baptist pointed people to Jesus, no? He's doubting. Law did not actually criticize him. In fact, he's commending him to the people. He's, whom do you go out to see? Whom do you go out to see? A reed swayed by the wind? No, much more than that. He talks about how among those born women, no one greater than John the Baptist. So look at the way, while he was doubting and he clarified that doubt, the Lord is commending him for the kind of ministry that he has, what kind of person he is. That's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not looking at what he's doing, rather going deep into his heart and what a life he led. A holy, righteous man. In fact, he says about King Herod, he feared John the Baptist, knowing him to be a holy and righteous person. So, Having a doubt is not wrong. When the Lord clarifies the doubt, accept it. So when you have doubts, it will affect faith. Prophesying is always by faith. John the Baptist prophesied about Jesus being the um, Lamb, Lamb of God by faith. But then when doubt came, the faith got affected. But how did it restored? By the Lord clarifying the doubt. In the case of John the Baptist, Messengers went back from Jesus to John the Baptist, clarifying that he is the Messiah. What about you and me? Today, you and me have the Holy Spirit who will take from Jesus and clarify to us. In John 16, chapter 13, 14, John, Jesus says, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will lead into all truth. He will lead you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He speaks only what he hears. Tell you what is yet to come. Okay, verse 14. He will bring glory to me, but take what is mine and make you known to you. Just like messengers took the uh, clarification of the doubt to John the Baptist from Jesus, today the Holy Spirit will take from Jesus and make known to us. When you have a doubt, don't despair. Ask him, Lord, please clarify this doubt, Lord. Let me know, Lord. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. He is our teacher. A reminder, and also the one leads us into all truth. In John 14, 26, the Lord told the disciples, when the counselor comes, when the Father sends in my name, he will teach you all things and he will remind you what I've taught you. 1 John 2, 27 says, the anointing will teach us all things. And therefore, having a doubt, nothing wrong. But then, Listen to the Holy Spirit who will clarify the doubt. Once he clarifies, thank him for it. Hold on to the truth and carry on in life. Otherwise, our faith gets affected. Now, when I began my ministry, the day after I accepted Christ, I began to share the gospel. Next day itself, and people just ask questions. I wouldn't know the answer. I tell them I don't know the answer. Almost most questions they put to me, I didn't know the answer. All I knew was this was my savior. Savior of the whole world. So I talk about that. He's your savior. He's my savior. Believe in him. The last questions, I'll say, I don't know. Night time and I pray, I'll say, Lord, this man asked a question to me. I didn't have the answer, Lord. Lord, give me the answer, Lord. Next time someone asks the same question, I want to know what to reply. God is so faithful. You should speak to me. I would forget my doubt. i put it God and forget about it. He would not forget he would remind me, he would clarify that out. I'm amazed to see how, how beautifully God clarified. I mean, before I became a believer, I used to have doubts about things of this world. Ask uh, the Lord to reveal to me, the living God. I wouldn't say Jesus, living God. But he answered my questions. 
So, don't condemn yourself because you have a doubt. Even John the Baptist, a great man of God, had doubts. The Lord clarified. So, go to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the Apostle High Priest, whom we confess. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. And then, doubt will go. Faith will be restored. The restorer of faith. He's the author and perpetual of faith. So, number one was sight. Number two, fears. Number three, doubt, obstacles in faith. Number four, I'm going to share five things today. Number four is having a guilty conscience. A guilty conscience shipwrecks our faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 18 19, we read, Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy, I give you this charge. He came in the process made about you. They were following them, we fight the good fight. Holding on to faith and a good conscience. Holding on to faith, which God has given you, and a good conscience. Some people rejected this and have shipwrecked their faith. They have shipwrecked their faith by not holding on to faith and a good conscience. Please never neglect a clear conscience. When a conscience gets disturbed because of something wrong we have done, Confess it, forsake it, and thank him for the, his blood that shed for us on the cross, by which we have, a, once again, a restored, clean conscience. The Apostle Paul always maintained clear conscience. In Timothy wrote, in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 3, God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, bears witness me. Clear conscience. Now, we have a, a bad conscience when we get convicted of sin. We feel bad, done something wrong. At that time, we go to Jesus and thank him for his blood. By faith in the blood, every guilty conscience is healed. Hebrews chapter 9, 13, 14 says, 13, verse 10, 14 verse, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a hyper Sprinkle those ceremony unclean, sanctify them that are outwardly clean. How much more than will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered him the unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, that we may serve the living God? The blood of Christ cleanses of every sin. Every sin in our heart, every guilty conscience is no more guilty, he's washed it. And therefore, we are made perfect by the blood once and for all. Hebrews 10, 14 says, By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. In Hebrews 10, 22, it says, Our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. When I have a bad conscience, I know the reason for the bad conscience. What sin you have done? Confess it. Forsake it. Judge yourself. You won't come under judgment. And thank him for that blood. That is why I believe that God has instituted this ritual of communion. communion. Among many other things, communion is the only, only ritual ordained by God in the New Testament is communion. Only ritual. Because as long as often you do it, you proclaim his death till he comes again. We remember the blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, by which we are made perfect. We have no perfection by ourselves. No, no righteousness by ourselves. We are made righteous by his blood. And therefore, there is no guilty conscience for a Christian. Now, in the Old Testament time, we read, when David sinned against God, he said, avoid God. Avoid God. Psalm 32, 3, 4, and 5 writes, Psalm 32 was 3, 4, and 5. When I kept silent, my bones wasted through my groaning all day long. For day and night, a hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I acknowledged my sin to you. Didn't cover up iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. When he sinned against God, he tried to avoid God. He kept silent. His bones wasted through my groaning all day long. God's hand was heavy upon him. 
Then he faced up to God. To whom did he face up to? To the Christ. His Lord was Christ. Very often I shared that in the, in the Bible. When he had fears, when he had guilt, guilt, he looked to the Lord, coming Christ, and then he was healed. Healed of all fears. Psalm 34 verse 8. Healed of the guilty conscience when he faced up to God. Problem is we don't face up to God and try to sort out the problem by yourself. We have sin, we have guilt. Effect of guilt is weakness. And our faith gets affected. A guilty conscience affects our faith. Neglect a clear conscience, we shipwreck our faith. We can know the promise of God, but if you don't have a clear conscience, you won't believe the promises for you. You may pray about many things. If you don't have a clear conscience, you may not believe prayers answered. That's why be right with God always. In 1 John chapter 3, Verse 22, we read, John writes, If hearts don't condemn us, 21, 22 verse of 1 John 3, if hearts don't condemn us, we are confident before God, receive him everything he asks, because you obey him, you do what pleases him. Always be right with God. We are always right with God, and very simple to be right with God. Confess your sins, forsake it, thank him for the blood, and ask him strength to go on. Pick up your thread and walk on. Further, he'll draw us out of sin. He is faithful and just. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, he'll forgive us and purify us from all righteousness. So, fourth obstacle in faith is a guilty conscience, an unclear conscience. But by the blood of Christ, we can restore that uh, clear conscience by thanking for the blood, repenting and moving on, and forgetting about the earlier. Sin. Once you repent and put it behind, don't think about it. Isaiah 43, 18, 19. Forget the former things. Don't dwell in the past. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do not perceive it, God says. I make you way in desert and stream in the wasteland. <laughs> so fourth obstacle for faith is a guilty conscience. Number five, the last one, is forgetting what God has spoken to us. As we hear God speak to us, our faith increases. When you forget what God has spoken to us and then look at the circumstances, our faith gets affected. A very familiar story once again. Luke chapter 8, verse 22 to 25. 8 chapter Luke, 22 to 25. The Lord gets into the boat. He was in Capernaum. He lived in Capernaum when he began his ministry. Three and a half years he lived in Capernaum. It's pronounced Kofar Nahum. Kofar means house. Nahum is a name. House of Nahum. And he left Kofar Nahum. He was going towards the east. Short distance. So three kilometers. I saw it. I measured distance. I keep the compass. When I was in uh, Sea of Galilee in Tiberias. Now I did all the research just to find out how long it would take him to cross that portion. He got, gets him to boat. And then he falls asleep. The Sabbaths are, uh, uh, are the sitting, they're, they're not asleep, they're awake. Then, normally, what happens in that area geographically, from the northwest, there's a valley. And when the valley suddenly uh, winds come, rains come, rain comes from the northeast, northwest only. Kapparam is north of Lake of Galilee, this northwest. And they're going towards the east. So, behind them, there was a wind and a rain, and the wind shut up the water, rain and storm was there. And then they tell Jesus, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And the Lord gets up. He rebooks the winds and the waves. He rebooks the disciples. He have little faith. He have little faith. He rebooks the winds and waves. The, uh, the winds and waves die down. He's sleeping. They wake him up. Master, master, we're going to drown. And then what happens? He gets up. First rebooks the winds and waves. Then rebooks the disciples. He have little faith. Now, what did God expect them to do? Did they expect Peter, James, and John, the disciples, to rebook the Indian waves? No. He expected them to believe what he had said. He had just told them, let us go to the other side of the lake. Let us go to the other side of the lake. And when he said that, they must believe that what he said will happen. He told them, let's go. Which means, 
they reach the other side of the lake. They will reach the other side. He didn't tell them to go and to get in the boat, to go and get down halfway. You know? They're supposed to believe what they said. They're going to go to the other side of the lake. And they forgot what he said in a matter of maybe a couple of hours. It doesn't take more than three, four hours to go across that, that region from northwest to uh, east in that Lake of Galilee. In a matter of a couple of hours, maybe, uh, maybe half an hour, they forgot what he said. They're going there. And they say, we're going to drown. He rebooks them for not believing and, and standing upon what he has said. Rather looking at the circumstances and forgetting what God has spoken. Today we live by the word. All of us are called to live by the word. Word means instructions, promises, and standards. When you walk in a step with his instructions, you preserve the peace of God, the joy of the Lord we preserve, we have confidence of the promise being fulfilled, and we hold on to promises by faith. If God says something, he will do it. In the Old Testament, we read in the book of Numbers, chapter 19, Balaam tells Balak, God is not a man that should lie. Son of a man that should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? When Lord says something, it will happen. Again, Isaiah 43, 13, God says, when I act, no, who can reverse it? When I act, who can reverse it? Nobody can reverse it. Here these people have been told, let's go out of lake. And then they begin to think, go to drown. And because they didn't trust what he said, Lord rebooks them for their lack of faith. He have little faith. He has some faith at least there. So this kind of forgetting what God spoke to us will affect our faith. Because our faith is actually supposed to be on what God has spoken. Faith in Christ means faith in his word. Even common uh, the everyday life, when you say I have faith in this person, you have faith in what he says. No? Credibility. I can trust this man. What he says, I will listen because I have faith in him. Normally, in everyday life, you say that. Faith in somebody means faith in what he says. I believe what he says. I don't doubt. How much more the Lord? When you have faith in Christ, you believe everything you said. And therefore, let not each one of us Forget what God spoke to us. Write down in, in a notebook, maybe. And uh, and if you need to forget, it doesn't matter. Holy Spirit will remind you. Depend upon the Spirit. Even if we forget, He will remind us of the promises given us. John 14, 26, He will teach you, He will remind you. So when you live by the word, Spirit, and faith, our faith will be secure. We grow in faith. Let not the obstacle the devil puts to us take away the faith we have got. Rather, we should grow in faith, not reduce our faith. It's possible to reduce. Like I said, five things, five obstacles. One is sight. Next is fear. Third is doubt. Fourth is a bad conscience. Fifth is forgetting what he's spoken to us. May God bless us. And I'm going to pray for all of us that we'd be a people who depend upon the Lord Jesus for increasing our faith and depending on the Holy Spirit for giving us the gift of faith for every crisis we face in life. He is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13 Even though we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. He is also faithful to increase our faith. How wonderful, no? He is faithful to increase our faith. So depend upon him. Don't get carried away by circumstances. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you of every one of us, Lord. Thank you much. You give us wisdom and strength, Lord to face every obstacle that comes in the way of our Christian life, especially faith. We live by faith, we minister by faith, we are saved by faith. Everything is by faith, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith you've given us, give us, Lord Jesus. We're always faithful, Lord. Help us trust in you always in every circumstance. Not trust in people, but trust in you. And I pray every one of us, Lord, will look to you, Lord, for guidance and help and counsel and empowerment. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.